You're listening to the Stoic Solutions Podcast, practical wisdom for everyday life inspired by ancient philosophers of Greece and Rome. I'm your host, Justin Vakula. Visit my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com. This is episode 99, A Field Guide to a Happy Life with Massimo Piliucci. In A Field Guide to a Happy Life, 53 Brief Lessons for Living, Piliucci brings the classic epitome of ancient Stoicism, Epictetus' handbook, up to date. Here's a blurb from his book that matches with the conversation we had back in 2020. The key to modern stoicism, Piliucci shows, is an emphasis on resilience and equanimity in the face of challenges and setbacks. Stoicism isn't about cultivating indifference to our social and emotional lives. It's about learning to endure life's hardships without being overwhelmed, while enjoying life's pleasures with humility and wisdom as our guides. If we start with the four cardinal virtues, practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance, we will grow into more honest, courageous, fair, and mindful individuals. In A Field Guide to a Happy Life, Piliucci shows how cultivating a stoic mindset can help us navigate these uncertain times. Massimo Piliucci is the K.D. Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York, the author or editor of 13 books. He has been published in The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Philosophy Now, and The Philosopher's Magazine, among others. He lives in New York City. Enjoy the conversation. All right. Thank you for joining me today and welcome back to the Stoic Solutions podcast. It's been a while since we last chatted. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be back. Thanks for having me. Great. And we're here today, of course, to talk about Stoicism and Epictetus and your newest book. Would you like to give a brief description of your new book to listeners? Yeah, the book is called A Field Guide to a Happy Life. And it, it's called A Field Guide because, you know, life happens in the field and not in the armchair of the philosopher. Uh, essentially, it is, it is a rewriting and update of uh, Epictetus and Caridian, which is one of the most famous and influential Stoic texts of antiquity. Which, of course, immediately raises two questions. Number one, why would anybody want to update the Enchiridion? <laughs> and number two, who the hell are you, Massimo, to think that uh, you can update Epictetus, right? <laughs> so, so if you don't mind, I'm going to start just right out by, by addressing both questions. The first one is, look, uh, Stoicism has always been updated. Uh, from the very beginning. We, we know from, for instance, from uh, the commentary uh, by Diogenes Laertius that Cleantes, the second head of the Stoa, had disagreements with Zeno, uh, the first head of the Stoa, and Chrysippus, the third head, had disagreement with both. So disagreement about uh, doctrine, about specifics uh, uh, of Stoicism has been going on literally since the beginning of the, the philosophy. And it shouldn't be surprising because philosophies of life, just like religions, which I actually happen to think are a kind of philosophy of life, they evolve over time, right? I mean, they, they evolve both in terms of internal, in response to internal pressure, you know, there are different practitioners, different people that have different ideas, and also in response to external pressure. In the case of the ancient Stoics, for instance, they were in constant conversation uh, and debate with the Epicureans, with the skeptics, with the Aristotelians, so they, they changed over time their position. So, it's kind of a, in a sense, I'm guessing I'm flipping around the question, right? Uh, and I say, you, look, it would be really strange if, the, if Epictetus did not need an update or if any philosopher did not need an update after so many centuries. So that's the answer to the first question. Why, why the hell would anybody want to update mm -hmm. Epictetus? The second one is, well, my, why me? Uh, well, you know, I, I'm the last uh, in a long line here. Uh, there have been at least five updates of uh, Epictetus and Caridian throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance, usually done by Christian authors who tried to sort of uh, uh, change the Enchiridion and update it in terms of Christian precepts. But also in modern times, uh, you know, Shannon LaBelle, for instance, came up with an update uh, with her own version of essentially of the Enchiridion as late as the mid-90s. So, so this is really the latest attempt. And in a sense, it is also my homage to Epictetus, because Epictetus is uh, the, by far the most influential of the Stoics, as far as personally, me personally, I'm uh, uh, concerned. And uh, you know, he had a major impact on my life. And so I figured, okay, uh, this is a, somebody who is less well known by the general public compared to other Stoic authors like Seneca or Marcus Aurelius. You know, for Stoic practitioners, Epictetus is a, is a household name. But outside of, of this somewhat small circle, uh, you know, most people don't know about Epictetus, which is really too bad. Right. Because I think he's, he's <laughs> one of the best thinkers of all time, not just Stoic thinkers, but best thinkers of all time. And so updating his, his, his language, his examples, and to some extent also 
the substance of his of his philosophy, I think uh, I'm hoping at least will bring more people into uh, you know to know Epictetus and to appreciate Stoicism in general. Yes, and a very practical handbook not only that Epictetus has, but yours. You're talking about how to live a good life. What are things that are important to us? Why we should be focused on virtue? and why Stoicism is still relevant today. Right. So, you know, the, the, the thing about the field guide is that it is divided into the core section of it. It's divided into 53 short sec- subsections. And this is not a chance, by chance. Uh, the Enchiridion itself is divided into 53 subsections. And uh, each one of the sections of the field guide mirrors exactly or parallels exactly the original, meaning that it is on the same topic. However, as I said, the lang- not only the language and the examples, but sometimes also the substance is is uh, a little bit different. It's updated according to my view of modern philosophy and modern science. And uh, the field guide begins with a general introduction to Stoicism and Epictetus, just in case people are not familiar with uh, either one of those. And uh, and then it ends actually with a, a table that has a side by side comparison in all cases in which I actually made what I consider substantial uh, changes compared to the original, then, then there is a table there uh, so that the reader can you know, clearly differentiate between what I say and what Epictetus says. Right, and it's important to have understanding of a lot of the terms, and if you're going to read the classic text, it can be hard to understand what they're getting at. What is this word? Right. What are these phrases that they're using? And one that comes about in the modern age and even in ancient times is happiness. What is it that you mean or think of when it comes to happiness? Oh, that's a great question. I actually try to stay away, even though it's in the title of my book. (laughs) I try to stay away from (laughs) from that word happiness because, of course, different people mean, you know, it's a rather amorphous uh, word and different people mean very different things by happiness. There is a reason why even contemporary uh, positive psychologists don't actually use anymore the word happiness. They use the word eudaimonia, which is the Greek word. Uh, that Epictetus and, and a bunch of other Hellenistic philosophers actually used. And I think one one way to understand actually the difference between different philosophies is precisely to see how they interpreted the word the eudaimonia. For instance, the Epicureans thought that eudaimonia is a life without pain, not only physical pain, but especially emotional pain, you know, mental pain. So that for, for the Epicureans, that was the, the highest good. And so a eudaimonic life is a life without pain. Uh, For the Aristotelians, a eudaimonic life is a life of flourishing, meaning a life in which not only you live virtuously, because you have to live virtuously, these are all kinds of virtue ethics, um, but you also have to have, and I stress have to, these are not optional, have to have a number of external advantages, external things, such as health, education, uh, a little bit of money, and even good looks, uh, uh, Aristotle says. If you don't have those things, you're, you're screwed. Even, even if you may be uh, virtuous, you, you don't have, you're not eudaimon because you cannot flourish. The Stoics had a very interesting understanding, I think, of eudaimonia. I tend to translate eudaimonia for, in, in the context of Stoicism as the life worth living. Now, of course, a life without pain is certainly worth living, right? <laughs> so agree, agreement with the, with the Epicureans there. A life of flourishing is also worth living, agreement with the Aristotelians there. However, the Stoics think that even if you are in pain, at least to a certain degree, and even if you cannot flourish because your external circumstances are such that uh, they don't allow you to flourish, you may still live a virtuous life, a sort of life worth living if you are doing something that is worth doing. Uh, my favorite example in modern times is somebody like Nelson Mandela. Uh, Mandela, of course, did not really flourish, not until late in his, in his life, I suppose. I mean, he spent 27 years in prison mm-hmm. and he was tortured for some of that time. So that's clearly not flourishing. It's also clearly not without pain. Right? He was suffering both physical and mental pain because anguish for his own condition, the condition of his family, the condition of his people. Nevertheless, a Stoic would say Mandela's life was definitely worth living. Why? Because he was, doing, he was acting virtuously. He was doing something that was worth doing. And even had he failed, I mean, we know that he actually succeeded in overturning the, uh, the, the apartheid government in South Africa. But even had he failed, 
it still would have been a life worth living according to Epictetus. Why? Well, he says, Epictetus says directly in the discourses, he says, look, um, somebody like that, it, it, of course, he's not, he wasn't talking about Mandela, he was talking about a, uh, an ancient Roman senator who opposed uh, one, of the, uh, one of the emperors who were, was behaving tyrannically, I think it was Vespasian. And Epictetus says, look, somebody like that is like the purple on the toga. It gives the example. It's the color, it's the bright color on a white background, right? It gives the example to others. And so his life is worth living. So the way I understand the, the, the stoic um, good life or the stoic happy life is a life worth living. And that can take a large number of different, uh, uh, you know, um, situations and forms. Um, but it is also a very ecumenical conception of eudaimonia, meaning that we all can live a life worth living. It really is entirely up to us. If you're an Aristotelian, it's not up to you, uh, because you know it depends on the your flourishing depends on external circumstances which you do not control. If you're an Epicurean, it's also not up to you because there may be external circumstances that will force pain on you. Um, but if you're a Stoic, especially physical pain, but if you're a Stoic, it is entirely up to you to live a life worth living, uh, because it only depends on what you on how how you act in life, regardless of your circumstances. Right. There are these major themes of acceptance, of making the best of things and yep. not overly complaining, not lamenting life and that, oh, look, I'm under six foot and this is terrible and life is no good. Right. <laughs> we're, we're going to accept those things that are outside of our control and make the best of things as much as we can. Correct. And, but one should also be very careful in there when we say these kinds of things, because the uh, the typical criticism or one of the typical criticisms of stoicism is that, oh, well, then it's a, you're talking about a quietist philosophy. You know, you just accept whatever happens. And that's clearly not what the stoics mean. Uh, you should de very much try to try to improve things for the human cosmopolis, for society at large. You should try to your best to work so that we make a better world. It's just that you have to, uh, from the beginning, accept that sometimes you're going to succeed and sometimes you're not. Mm -hmm. Because outcomes are not entirely up to you. Only your intentions and your actions are up to you. But the outcomes of those actions are not. Right. You talk about poker in your yes. book and some analogies between stoicism, poker, and life and that, well, you can make the best moves at the table. You can get all your money in with pocket aces and that guy just gets there with whatever random hand he has. And even though you made the best decision, you don't always win the money in the short run. But we're talking about just making informed decisions for the long run and focusing on the right things. Exactly. And, and in fact, a good poker player is somebody who knows uh, how to play even the worst of the hands because he may lose on that particular round because he did, you know, because the circumstances that handed him or her a bad hand, but in the long run, he's going to do well yes. um, because right. He takes advantage of the situations where he has a good hand and he minimizes damage in situations where he doesn't have a good hand. And so in the long run, uh, that person essentially in a sense overcomes luck. Yes, it's one of my favorite passages within Epictetus to behave as the dice counters do. Whatever comes up is not in my control, but how I use skill and how I apply myself to the circumstances is what's important. Exactly. To further this idea of betting, you write in your book to not place bets on the wrong things, not pursuing things like fame, for example, or lavishness, that maybe these are the wrong areas of focus in life. Yes, precisely. I mean, that was one of the major distinctions of uh, between Stoicism and a number of other philosophies, and certainly between Stoicism and sort of the, the normal way of thinking about things, right? I mean, we all grow up and we're told by our parents, our peers, sometimes even our teachers, uh, and certainly society at large, that um, success means, you know, making money, having a good career, you know, uh, succeeding and, you know, having a nice house, all of those, all those things. And uh, even even having a you know successful marriage or relationship or whatever you want, well, but all of those things for a stoic are not under our control. We can certainly influence them, of course. That's another thing that we need to be clear. Not being entirely out, under our control doesn't mean that we cannot influence things. Of course, we can. Mm -hmm. Right? We can make decisions. But but the decision part is up to us. The outcome again is not. 
And so focusing on these externals is the wrong bet, according to the Stoics, because in that case, as Seneca famously uh, puts it, you're basically putting yourself in the, in the hands of fortune. And fortune is fickle. Fortune can smile on you for a certain period of time, and then all of a sudden turns against you and you lose everything. And then, then what are you going to do? If you, if you bet your happiness, your eudaimonia, on externals, you might be in, in dire circumstances. Uh, and on the other hand, if you bet on your character, if you bet on your internal ability to this, make decisions, arrive at correct judgments, and so on and so forth, uh, then you cannot fail to, to be happy. Epictetus says so very early on in the Enchiridion, where he basically promises that if you really understand what belongs to you, meaning what is up to you, and what doesn't belong to you, meaning what is not up to you, uh, then you will not uh, have a complaint in life. You, nobody will force you to do anything, and you'll be perfectly happy because you're free. Uh, you're free from dependence on external circumstances. Yes, we can choose to forge our own paths in life and play different roles, the Stoics even talk about, that it's not like everyone should just be this husband or we're following in the footsteps of what our parents did in life, that, that we have choices and we can apply ourselves where we see fit. That's right. In fact, Epictetus, uh, in particular, developed an idea that goes a little bit further back in Stoicism to Panicius, who was one of the uh, middle Stoics, so-called middle Stoics, uh, and that's the idea of role, uh, role ethics. So Epictetus says that we play three categories, three classes of roles in life. One is the role of a human being, a member of the human cosmopolis, right? Then there are roles that are assigned to us by fate. So I'm somebody else's uh, son, for instance, right? I couldn't help that. That's, that's just the way it is. And then there are roles that we pick for ourselves given the circumstances. So in my case, for instance, you know, I'm a university professor. Well, I picked that. Uh, or I'm a writer, so I picked that. I'm a, a friend uh, and I have a daughter. I also picked that one and so on and so forth. Mm. And Epictetus says that the fundamental role of a human being trumps everything else. That should be the most important thing we should always have the good of the human cosmopolis in mind. Then saving that, uh, we need to learn how to uh, juggle the other, the other roles to the best of our abilities. And Epictetus uh, has this really interesting uh, phrase in the discourses where he says, look, at some point you will have to compromise, um, you know, because, because the different roles have a different, di different demands. I mean, for instance, uh, I have a role as a teacher and as a colleague, uh, you know, in my university, but I also have a role as a father uh, and as a husband at home, right? And so now those roles might come into conflict at some point. You know, how much time or effort and so on and so forth do I devote to one or the other? At some point, there will, there, there will be a compromise. There will be some kind of, you know, uh, limit that I, that I reach. And Epictetus says, whatever limit, whatever compromise you reach, it's up to you. You know, only you can make that judgment and it depends on your specific circumstances. Nobody from the outside can tell you. However, he says, you know, that would be the point where you sell your integrity. So at some point you will sell your integrity. You have to compromise. Uh, and he says, just make sure for, for, for God's sake that you sell your integrity as high as possible. Right? <laughs> yes. A lot of humor in his text for sure. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. <laughs> We're, we're going to make these informed choices. We're going to be deliberate about our life to think ahead and try to avoid conflicts when we can. But of course, they're, they're always going to happen. And another theme you mentioned is not to enter contests you can't win. And part of the notion of good judgment is to realize when it is that, you know, it, it's, that's a particular kind of enterprise or a particular kind of activity is just not not likely to succeed and you shouldn't be wasting a lot of time. Epictetus again uses an interesting example. He says, so you want to be an athlete in the Olympic Games, don't you? Well, who doesn't, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, uh, but of course, people who want to be athletes in the Olympics is because they think immediately about, you know, getting the laurel and, you know, winning the competition and everything. But have you really thought about very carefully about what that entails. I mean, that entails a lot of training, that entails, you know, a food, re you know, eating regime of a particular kind, that entails you are not, not going to be able to do certain things, that entails that somebody might throw you down into the, on the ground and you eat dust, uh, you know, that entails a lot of pain and, and so on and so forth. After you consider all of that, are you sure you still want to do, you know, become an athlete and participate in the Olympics? And if the answer is yes, by all means. But, but now you know what that entails, right? And so the notion is not, 
uh, that we should not try things that are not certain because that, you know, that would be a recipe for not doing almost anything. <laughs> right. There's no certainty in life anyway. Uh, you know, then, then you just stay there and don't do anything. That's not the point. The point that Epictetus uh, brings up, I think, is a very reasonable one. It is like um, make sure once you embark or before you embark in a certain direction that you are cognizant of what that entails and that you are ready and willing to go through it. And, you know, unfortunately, in our culture, we do have a tendency to tell other people, especially children, that, you know, that can be whatever they want to be. It's like, bullshit. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the case. Yeah. I mean, since when? That is just not the case, right? I mean, the, because everybody has limitations. And those limitations sometimes are intrinsic to the person. I mean, for instance, uh, you know, if I, if I wanted to become a you know, composer, well, good luck, because my musical ability is near, <laughs> near zero. So it's like, no, that's just not going to happen. And it wasn't going to happen when I was a child. I just did not have the year for it. I didn't have the, the, you know, the propensity for that sort of stuff. So no, that was never going to happen. So that, that goes one thing that I couldn't have done. And then there are other things that you cannot do because of circumstances, right? Not, not because of your inherent qualities, but because of circumstances. Like, you know, I want to become president of the United States. No, I can't, because I was born in Italy. And, you know, by law, I can't become a president of the United <laughs> States. End of story. So, you know, now, is that my fault? No, of course not. But it does mean that it's useless for me to even contemplate that possibility because it's just not going to happen. So, uh, by all means, we should certainly strive and, uh, for the best that we can do. And we should certainly encourage our children to do the best that they want to do. Uh, but it's really not reasonable. And, in fact, it sets up f people for failure to tell them things like, oh, you can be whatever you want to be. Like, no, no, you can't. And if you're telling that to children, you, you're going to set them up for disappointment. Right. And sometimes people are looking for that external validation. They're looking for that prestige. But stoicism tells us, hey, we shouldn't be so concerned about what other people think. If we're doing something that's virtuous, if we're exercising virtue, then that's fine. If you're just this person behind the scenes uh, working in a counseling role or doing something that benefits the good of society and you're living a modest life, well, isn't that enough? Correct. And the, the, the thing is, the, there's only one exception to that rule. We should be listening to other people if they have something to teach us. Right. So that's the only time when, when we can actually learn from other people. If somebody, for instance, is criticizing us uh, and we, upon reflection, think, you know what, that was a good point then we should definitely listen to those people. But other than that, why would you care about the opinion of other people, about your life? It's your life, not theirs. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. We've talked about this in our previous discussion that even some people who make those large sums of money, they have all this lavishness and wealth. Some of them are still not happy and they're living paycheck yeah. to paycheck and they find new problems. And yeah. well, what was that really all that it was cracked up to be? That's right. In fact, there is pretty good research now in social psychology that shows that that money is only very, very indirectly related to happiness. And it is related in a particular way. Uh, people, you know, social psychologists found that people, yes, they are, they tend to be unhappy if they're really poor. Right. If you don't have means of, of, of sustenance, uh, if you don't have a high, you know, house or, a, the, mm -hmm. or an apartment or whatever, if you can't put dinner on your on your plate, then then you, it's going to be hard for to be happy. Right. I mean, a stoic would say even under those conditions, I can still be virtuous. But for most for the rest, uh, you know, most most other people, that would be really hard. But it turns out that the threshold uh, in terms of income. Uh, after which more money doesn't seem to make much difference in the way of happiness, it's pretty small. It's pretty low. It's, it's, it's remarkably low. It turns out that people, once the basic necessities are taken care of, and then maybe a little bit of extra money to do a few, a few extra things, then uh, uh, additional income does not actually make you happier. It makes you, of course, your life more pleasant, perhaps. You know, easier. It's easier to do certain things. There's no question about that. Uh, it's not that money, money doesn't have value, it, even according to the Stoics. Uh, ma money is one of those pr so-called preferred indifference, right? So those are things that are indifferent because they don't make you a, a better person. Therefore, they don't matter in terms of your virtue. Um, but they are preferred, other things being equal, because uh, they do make your life better. 
Epictetus, again, uh, says in the discourses at some point, in, I think in the, uh, very early on in the first volume of the discourses, somebody says, uh, you know, should, shouldn't you make him, be making money so that you can help your friends, you know, things like that. And Epictetus' response is, absolutely, no problem. If I can make money in an honest way without compromising my character, and if I'm going to use that money appropriately. But if that's not possible, then I'd rather stay be, be without money because that's just not worth the trade-off. Yes, there's an important question within Stoicism. What's being traded for what? The Stoics call for us to be very mindful. And if we're working this job, we're putting in these 60 hours a week and we don't have any free time, we can't do what we want to do, we're always tired, is that really worth it to get that extra money? Exactly, exactly. And there are, you know, those trade-offs... Uh, a lot of people just don't think very carefully about those trade-offs because we grow up in a society, especially in the United States, where we are already told from since when, when we're little that, you know, this is the definition of success. Uh, and then it turns out that a lot of people follow that definition of success, pursue that definition of success, and then they're miserable in their life. So it's like, again, there is research there, too, in social psychology. A lot of psychologists have asked uh, people on their deathbed, basically, you know, terminally ill patients and things like that. Uh, what they regret in life and what they cherish about their life, right? And I guarantee you, there were very few people, if any, who regretted not having an extra, you know, paycheck or an extra <laughs> million dollar or an extra, you know, anything. Uh, most of what people regretted was not spending enough time with family and friends, you know, not having good, solid relationships with people. It's we, because we are relational animals. And so... Yeah, you can have three cars and two houses and a helicopter and all that sort of stuff. But if, if you're alone, <laughs> when you die, there's nobody gives a crap about you. I'm not <laughs> sure that was worth the, the trade-off. Sure. In fact, I'm pretty sure it wasn't worth the trade-off. Right. And, and Stoicism, they're, they're not calling for, the Stoic authors aren't calling for a life of poverty and living in the streets, but rather a life of moderation and saying, hey, yeah. well, okay, maybe those nice dinners could be good once in a while, but we're not going to spend all of our money on it. And maybe it's just not worth what people are assigning yeah. to. That's right. So on the, 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 actually, that's an important point to, to stress. On the one hand, the Stoics certainly are not, they're not cynics. The cynics were the ones that lived their lives without uh, property, without money, without family relations or anything. They were just going around. They were basically the, the ancient equivalent of itinerant, itinerant monks. They were just going around reminding people that were not that were not virtuous. The Stoics are definitely not cynics. They don't. We don't. We don't vow poverty for power, poverty and things like that. However, Seneca, among others, uh, also warns against uh, ex ex excessive consumption. He says, you know. Uh, the problem with, and it's, he's not the only one, Musonius Rufus does the same. He was uh, Epictetus' uh, teacher. Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, also makes the same point. All of these people tell you that it's like, look, the problem with ex excessive consumption is that once you start living larger than what you need, right? So eating a lot, having a lot of, you know, having much more space available than you need, having, you know, many more, I don't know, pairs of shoes than you need or something like that. Uh, once you start doing that, then there is no, uh, no end point. Okay? Uh, if, uh, if I feed enough, if I feed myself in, with healthy meals and you know, enough to live well and so on and so forth, that's great. That's the, the, my body is the measure of what I, I need. But if I start accumulating a lot of stuff or a lot of, of, of externals that I cannot even use because they're just a lot of, a lot of things, then... At that point, I am going. There is no stopping point. There is no end point to it. I want to have. Why, why only ten pairs of shoes? Why not twenty? Why not thirty? Why not fifty? <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I want two houses, three houses. Why not five? Why not ten? Uh, and at that point, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> You're going after these things that you are not even possibly going to have enough time in your life to really enjoy. Right. How many houses do you really can you possibly really enjoy? Um, you know, there's only limited time you can spend in each one of them. And, you know, how many uh, cars can you possibly really drive and, and, and enjoy? Why do, why do you need all of that, that stuff? So the Stoics are not minimalists uh, in the sense of the cynics, meaning that they, they're not ascetic, I should say. But they tend to veer toward minimalism. And, you know, like, okay, 
enough is enough. Once you have enough, then focus on the really important things in life, which for the Stoics, of course, is the cultivation of our own character. Uh, you know, trying to do uh, good things for the human cosmopolis, that sort of stuff. That's what should be taking up our efforts and our attention. Right. So we're calling for that mindfulness. We're calling for that moderation and not allowing some sort of lifestyle creep to get upon exactly. us. Like re recently I, I traveled and I had a complimentary upgrade to fly in first class. And I said, you know, that was nice, but I'm not willing to, say, pay an extra, like, $500 just to do it again. Like, I, I was okay exactly. with it. It was nice, but it's not necessary to live a fulfilled life. So I, I can exactly. use these benefits. I, I can do this and that. But I'm not going to lose my mind in the process, run up all of this debt and not pay it back and, and exactly. go broke, right? So there's And that. it's also, you know, I have actually had the same experience. I react in the same, in the same way. But it's also a question of... It's not even when you don't have the money, because, of course, if people would say might say, you know, well, if you cannot afford it, of course, you shouldn't do it. But there are a lot of things that I can afford and I'm still not doing not doing them. Yeah. Uh, you know, I live in downtown Brooklyn uh, in New York City. And, uh, you know, my wife and I make a, a pretty good living teaching at, uh, at City University of New York. And we could afford, for instance, of course, before the pandemic, uh, we could afford to go out for dinner basically every night. But we don't, or we didn't. And the reason we didn't is because going out for dinner for us should be a treat. It's, you know, once in a while you go out for a special occasion or you, or you see your friends or something like that. But the rest of the time, we actually love staying at home and, and, and cooking our own food and, you know, uh, preparing our own stuff. It costs a lot, a lot less, but it's not, it's not that we do it because we don't want to spend the money or we don't have the money. It's just much more fulfilling experience than, uh, than constantly going out and seeking out, you know, gourmet uh, restaurants. In New York City, people are crazy. Easy, uh, from my perspective. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, they, they used to, again, before the pandemic, going out for, for dinner almost every night or taking out, you know, having, having takeouts. Like, no, cooking, it's a great experience. And, and when we do cook, we cook accordingly, according to, to pretty much the precepts that Musonius Rufus lays out in his lectures. Uh, simple, hearty food, you know, nutritious, uh, you know, good tasting, you know, but simple to make. It uh, doesn't have to come from the other side of the world. It doesn't have to have a, a, a huge carbon footprint uh, in order to make it to my dinner table. And, uh, and we're very happy with that because then, then we can focus our energy and our uh, you know, abilities to something on something else, something more interesting, more important. And you have more peace of mind as well rather yes. than scampering about of, okay, well, I, this bill is coming up and I don't know if I'm going to be able to afford it. That if you're able to cut out a lot of those things that you don't really need, then you have that. Because I, I know people yeah. who like this, this lavish type of lifestyle, they're, they're trading that away for this, um, well, okay, my rent is coming up and I, I don't know where that's going to come from. And like, well, you had that pleasure for that like 30 minutes in the restaurant maybe. But now what? Now you're stressing over finances. So is that really worth <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. The, there is a, yet another bit in Epictetus that, that basically directly addresses that situation. He says, uh, you know, look, when you're about to refrain, you know, when you're considering refrain from a pleasure that is unnecessary, think about it this way. Just focus for a, for a moment on the short period of time during which you will experience the pleasure and then remind yourself of the much longer period of time where you're going to regret that pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we laugh at this stuff. Some of our critics will say, oh, you're just killjoys. You're just saying, right. oh, you don't don't have anything. But but in my case, I, I get to travel a lot. I have all these great experiences and I pay next to nothing to do it. Just taking advantages of uh, credit card rewards, reward programs. That's been a right. recent hobby of mine. It's like, hey, look, I can have those experiences too, but I'm not... Uh, spending unnecessarily i'm not having to pay up all this money i can be smart about the way i'm doing it exactly i mean i don't i honestly don't feel deprived of anything <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know it's not a, um, a question of, of killjoy it's a question of redefining what what to take joy in right uh seneca actually writes in one of his, you know, of his letters to his friend lucidus he says you know my friend one of the things you need to know and you need to learn is to experience joy so it's, it's, it's simply not true that the Stoics are not joyful or not enjoying things. It's just that we have a different conception 
uh, what makes us joyful in the first place, uh, what really is important in life. I much rather spend an evening with uh, close friends for, for whom I cook a nice and simple meal than spend a lot of money on my own uh, to go to a you know Michelin rated uh, <laughs> restaurant. It's just not the same thing. It's the, it's a far more in my mind at least the the experience of relating to my friends in uh, at home is far more precious than the experience of saying oh I went out there and I spent three hundred dollars on a single d- uh, dinner it's like okay good for you <laughs> but what did you get out of it right right yes yeah, so you could have those social experiences without uh, breaking the bank and exactly. yes making the food at home I, I've been. Uh, a big fan of my rice cooker now for like three or four years, put all the ingredients myself, very easy, very little cleaning, like, whoa, what more can I really want there? <laughs> and it's uh, another uh, a related theme in your book, you write to be a philosopher, not one of the crowd. Yeah, that is, that's, um, uh, that comes directly from a, a sentence, a phrase from Epictetus, and we need to be careful there what it, what it, what it means to be a philosopher. So I'm a philosopher in both senses of the word. Uh, I am an academic philosopher. You know, I got a P- I have a PhD in philosophy, and I actually teach philosophy, uh, and I write technical papers in philosophy. That's what most people nowadays think of as a philosopher. But that's, not, of course, not what the Epictetus or the Stoics mean. Uh, a philosopher, being a philosopher in that sense, is simply somebody who wants to use philosophy to live a good life, right? who is mindful about living a good life, who, is, who is, is reflective about how to improve uh, her, opinion, uh, her, her experience of life. In that sense, philosophy is the art of living, right? It's not an academic discipline. It's not a specialized field of research or, or scholarship. It is the art of living. And so we can all be philosophers in that second sense. And in fact, I think the Stoics would argue we should, we should all be philosophers in that, in that sense. Uh, in, you know, they go back to the famous phrase by Socrates who said that the unexamined life is not worth living. And what Socrates meant by it is um, that a lot of people just live their life. They sleepwalk through their life. Mm-hmm. They, don't, they don't pay attention to what they're doing. They don't ask themselves, why, are, why am I doing this as opposed to something else? And then they are likely to mislive their lives their life to get to the end of it and say oh crap was that it um and that is, that's what happens when you don't live your life philosophically but again philosophically in the broad sense of the art of living not not of an academic uh, discipline and we're also to be mindful you write of the company we keep as other yes. people certainly have influence on us there's this theme within the stoic texts about uh people being around people it can be like rust rubbing off on us yep. or for more modern readers i imagine one of the characters from charlie brown and the peanuts <laughs> or yes. pig pen is walking around and there's that dust cloud <laughs> about him that's right exactly so now that um that counsel from the stoics uh, does come across sometimes as elitist right so oh my come on you only want to associate yourself with certain people but in fact if you think about it epictetus there is just telling you what Probably, I assume, your mom was telling you when you were a kid, you know, be, be careful what company you keep, right? Uh, because there are some people who are not good for us. Uh, some people who uh, will, will tempt us to do things that are actually not good for us. And then there are, on the other hand, by contrast, other people who are good for us because they're good role models. They're, 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 they help us grow. They help us become better, better individuals, better human beings. So why wouldn't you want to associate with people who help you out? as opposed to people who drag you down. It's like, that seems like a no-brainer to me. Um, so it's not meant to be elitist. It's just meant to be very sound advice about, you know, careful how you spend your time and with whom you, you spend uh, your time. Yeah. Right. To definitely be mindful of that, as I think most people will happen to be friends with people they grew up with, or, oh, it's just because this person's in my area, and it's this scarcity mindset that people have and it goes into pseudoscience in some ways where people talk about soulmates oh this person is my soulmate it's like hmm well you know why wasn't it someone from the other side of the country (laughs) it just happened to be someone you lived near or went to high school with right you know i I love um a song by the uh by an australian comedian tim minchin Mm -hmm. uh about about soulmates uh and he, he actually dedicated this song to his wife with whom he has been in fact married for a long time and et cetera but the song goes I don't remember the exact words, but it goes something like this. It says, you know, you're one in a million. You know, I can't, I couldn't, couldn't imagine my life without you. You're one in a million. But uh, that means 
that by my calculations, there must be in several other, other hundred thousands just like you or who would do just as well. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. And so, it's like, so there is no such thing as the soulmate. There are people, ideally, uh, you know, uh, if you're lucky, there are people with whom you really click, you really things really go well. But uh, it's, it's very dangerous thinking to think about soulmates and about some kind of you know, metaphysical predestination of, thing, uh, of things like that. By the way, you, you mentioned pseudoscience, and there is also science about this kind of stuff, of course. Uh, again, there is research in social psychology that shows that who you hang around with actually really does affect your behavior dramatically in, in, in many cases, and vice versa, you can affect uh, the behavior of other people. For instance, there is research that shows that if one of your friends smokes, uh, you have a 50% chance of, of taking up smoking. And vice versa, if they stop smoking, there's a very large uh, uh, probability that you're actually going to stop smoking yourself. So friends in particular, you know, uh, they do influence each other. And in fact, these influences also go to second or third level uh, acquaintances. So, so we do influence other people for the better or for the worse. And uh, a stoic would say, well, we should try to influence them for the better. Absolutely. And with alcohol abuse, that's a common thing yes. that I've read as well, of that it's the social situation that brings people together and like, oh, well, my friends are just the friends from the bar and that's just where we go and drink. But it's like, oh, well, couldn't you just meet them on a different occasion that if you're able to change some of the environment, then some of those destructive habits would lessen. That's right. Exactly. And uh, Tim mentioned, by the way, look, I'm not undervaluing what we've got when I say, given the role chance inevitably plays, is the inherently flawed notion of fate. It's obtruse to deduce that I found my soulmate at the age of 17. It's just mathematically unlikely that at a university in Perth, I happen to stumble upon that one girl on Earth. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I won't sing it. I'll just say it for the listeners today. Certainly <laughs> singing is not my uh, <laughs> my forte here. <laughs> are, there, are there things within Stoicism that you disagree with? You, you've mentioned the idea of God or some kind of metaphysical grounding of things. Yeah, that actually is one of the reasons I wrote the field guide uh, to a happy life, because there are a number of things that I think need update in Stoic philosophy, both in terms of their metaphysics and in terms of their, their ethics. So the Stoics, let's step back for a second here. Uh, the Stoics thought, I, I think correctly, that there are three areas of study or, or areas of inquiry that we should keep in mind if we want to live a good life. One is it's the obvious one. It's the ethics. The ethics for for, Sto for the Stoics means how to live the study of how to live your life, right? And that's obviously the, the one that we really focus on. But the ethics is in turn uh, influenced by two things: what they call the logic, which basically stands for in in general sound reasoning, right? So anything that improves your reasoning, it's going to improve your life. Why? Because a good life, according to the, Sto to the Stoic, is a life where you arrive at good judgments. And you cannot arrive at good judgments if you don't reason correctly. Right? So you should study logic. And, uh, and then the, the, other, the third field is what they call physics. But physics in, in, Greek, in ancient Greek just meant nature. So the study of nature. In other, in other words, you have to understand reality. If, uh, to, your, to the best of your abilities, because if you don't understand reality to the best of your ability, you are likely to make mistakes, right? If you, if you operate uh, in life according to a uh, system of beliefs that doesn't actually reflect the way the world really works, you are likely to make mistakes, right? And so the, the, the notion is that these three things kind of co-evolved in, in, uh, during the history of Stoic philosophy. The ethics changes as a result of changes in the logic and the physics. Now, Stoic logic is pretty damn, damn good even today. You know, the Stoics had a more advanced system of logic than Aristotle. Uh, and it was a system of logic that was known throughout the Middle Ages and actually was still the dominant, it's called propositional logic, it's still the dominant system, was still the, the dominant system of logic until the end of the 19th century. Uh, logic only got better, more sophisticated after the, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. However, the kind of logic that we need to use on, on, on everyday, uh, you know, in everyday life actually doesn't need to be any more sophisticated than propositional logic. Sometimes it's referred to as zero-order logic. 
And uh, so the Stoics actually, I think, are fine in terms of logic. There's, there's nothing really that need to be improved, uh, it, which is remarkable if you think about it, because that means that something that lay, they laid down 2,300 years ago still works per perfectly well. There's really not much that, that we need to improve there. We can complement Stoic logic with modern uh, research in cognitive science, for instance, about cognitive biases, things like that. But those are those are really minor improvement. They don't negate anything in Stoic logic. Stoic physics, however, it's a different matter, because of course the Stoics had a very different uh, conception of the world compared to what we have today. Particularly, the Stoics thought that the universe itself was a living organism endowed with the logos, the ability to reason. Okay. And they thought that we're literally bits and pieces of this gigantic organism. And we ourselves are, of course, endowed with the logos, the ability to think rationally. Now, in modern, modern physics and modern metaphysics, don't buy that idea. Okay? Uh, we don't think that the universe is a living organism endowed with reason. We think that the universe is a set of dynamic processes uh, that uh, follow what we call the laws of nature. Right. And that are described and those processes are described by basic physical theories such as quantum mechanics and general relativity. There is really no space there for a living organism at a cosmic level. Now, why do we care? I mean, it's like, OK, so fine. The Stoics were, were wrong about that aspect of their metaphysics. By the way, they were actually correct about a bunch of other aspects. For instance, they believed in. Uh, universal cause and effect. We still do that today. Modern science is based on the on the notion of universal cause and effect. Um, they were materialists, meaning uh, that they thought that everything that has causal powers is made of stuff, uh, and we still essentially hold to the same belief. We just define stuff more broadly than they did. Right? For us, stuff is whatever the physicists tell us that it is, uh, but we still maintain the same general idea. Uh, they were determinists, meaning that they, they thought there was no exception to the laws of cause and effect, and so neither, neither do we. You know, modern scientists don't think that there are exceptions to the law of cause and effect because those exceptions are, are called miracles, and we don't believe in miracles uh, in, modern, in modern science, and so on and so forth. So there is a number of things in uh, ancient, metaphysic, ancient Stoic metaphysics that are still holding today, but... That particular notion of the living organism, the cosmos as a living organism, doesn't hold. Now, what follows? Well, something important follows there from in, in terms of the ethics, which is why we care. Because, again, if the Stoics were just wrong about one aspect, you know, an arcane aspect of their metaphysics, okay, fine, not a, not a problem. But if that aspect of metaphysics has consequences for the ethics, for how we actually live our life, then we care. Then, then we need to adjust things accordingly. And that's one of the major things that I do in the field guide. I, I, I try to make those kinds of adjustment, uh, adjustments while still retaining the core philosophical ideas of Stoicism because I don't want to move to another philosophy. I think the Stoicism is fundamentally sound. It's fundamentally correct. But it does need to be updated in that sense. Now, the thing that follows if we abandon the notion of a uh, living organ, a living cosmos, a living universe, is that we cannot all, no longer afford to believe in Stoic providence. Uh, and this is a really important point. So let me let me take a couple of minutes to to explain it. So if you read uh, the Stoics in general, but Epictetus in particular, there are a number of passages, both in the Enchiridion and in the Discourses, that are rather puzzling, if not cringeworthy, by modern standards. For instance, there are passages where he says, you know. Every night when, when you uh, kiss goodbye to your wife and your child, remember that they're mortals and they might not be the, there the following day. But if they die, you should not be disturbed. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. What do you mean I shouldn't <laughs> be disturbed? Um, you know, people who have a, a superficial understanding of stoicism uh, read that kind of passage and say, this guy was a psychopath. That's, what, what the hell is going on here? We actually know that, that uh, Epictetus was apparently a really nice guy. Uh, in, in late in his life, for instance, he rescued a, a child from a, of a friend that otherwise would have been would have been dead, and you know he raised him as his own. So he was actually a really a nice guy. So what what is he saying there? Well, he's saying something that makes perfect sense if you believe in in Stoic providence. Uh, he's basically saying, look, uh, we are. He uses this metaphor. He, he says we are like the foot of a body. At some point, the body has to go home and cross a uh, muddy path, and it is up to the foot to step into the mud. Now, if you just think think of the situation in terms of I am the foot, uh, you say, 
that's disgusting. I don't want to step into the mud. That's horrible. Why do I have to do that? That's not, I don't like it, right? But if you understand that you're part of a larger body and you know that the only way to, for the body to get home is to cross that path uh, where there is mud and you also know that you happen to be the foot and so that's really your duty to step in so that the rest of the, the, the entire body can get home, then not only you are going to accept your fate, you're actually going to embrace it. You're going to be happy about it. Like, oh, goody, I'm doing my, my job here. I'm, this is what I was born for. Right? This is what a foot is supposed to be doing. So I'm actually happy. That is the sense that in that sense, the Stoics believed in providence. And in that sense, then you can you can understand why Epictetus says, hey, you know, if your loved ones die, you should be happy. You should not be disturbed because whatever happens is for the good of the universe. It may not be necessary for your good. Right. Because you're the foot. You're, you're still going to have to step into the mud. And that's unpleasant. But it is for the good of the universe. And what else could you possibly ask in life other than helping the entire universe? Right. You should be embracing your fate. As Nietzsche much later on put it, amor fati. Right. Love your fate. Right. Ex acceptance. And death is also exactly. a major theme in Stoicism. That exactly. It's just something that we ought to accept. We cannot escape. But it's more than acceptance, right? It's not only acceptance, it's actually embracing. The, the, the phrase, love your fate, is, implies far more than just accepting it, right? It means that you really ought to be happy about it. Now, what I had suggest in the, the field guide is that, well, that was very nice then, but it doesn't work today because we don't believe in the universe as living organism. Therefore, we do not believe in stoic fate. I, I am not the foot of a larger organism. I'm just a piece of matter hanging around on a speck of dust in a particular area, you know, sector of the galaxy. And so what happens to me doesn't help the rest of the universe. The rest of the universe is entirely irrelevant. Uh, you know, what happens to me is entirely relevant to the rest of the universe. It just is. The universe is completely neutral in terms of my fate. And so in that case, I have to revert to what you just said a minute ago. That is, my only option now is to accept my fate, not to embrace it. I cannot be, if my daughter should die or my wife should die tomorrow, I cannot possibly reasonably be happy, even within a modern stoic uh, framework, because there is no point to their death. It's just, it's just something, you know, they're gone, that's it. Uh, but I can and should accept it because I understand that death is a natural process and that it can happen to anybody at any time. Right. So it, acceptance is still derived from the stoic principle that the only reasonable thing to do is to face whatever happens if you do not have any control over it. Right. Um, but I don't need to go the extra step and say, oh, yeah, goody. <laughs> that was a great thing. <laughs> no, that's not a great thing. Right. It's OK to be uh, disturbed in that sense. Uh, if, if your loved ones uh, die. But that disturbance is tempered by the fact that you understand that that is what happens to human beings, right? That is, you know, people die. Um, and everybody dies. And, and not only that, but there is no guarantee of when that's going to happen. We often do say things like, oh, so-and-so died prematurely, right? And uh, Seneca actually says, like, at some point in one of the letters to Lucidus, like, prematurely compared to what? I mean, how did you know? <laughs> right? it, the person died exactly at the moment in which the web, the cosmic web of cause and effect determined that they were going to die. Not a moment too soon, not a moment too late. <laughs> right? There's no such thing as a premature death. We think of premature death in terms of statistical expectations. In fact, I, as an exercise, I kind of I looked it up the, a few days ago. Um, I said, look, I'm 56 and I live in New York City and I'm a white man. So given those parameters, what is my life expectancy? And it turns out to be 79. Right. So but I cannot go around in good conscience and say, oh, I have 23 more years to go. Like, I don't know that. <laughs> that is only a statistical expectancy. I could be dead tonight. You know, I could buy, you know, we finish the con this conversation. I'm, I'm going to go grocery shopping. I might get hit by a car and that's it. End of story. Or I might beat the statistics by a decade or more. Right, right. Because of, you know, because of accidents, because of my genetic constitution, because of all sorts of things. Right. So those expectations are statistical only. 
There's no such a thing as a premature death. You die when, when you die. You die when the cause and effect has determined that you're going to die. So that's one of the, the major differences in the book, in the field guide with, with the Enchiridion. There are, uh, there are others that I think are actually important, however, to take a look at. For instance, the Stoics naturally were uh, inevitably a uh, product of their own time, right? Uh, you know, you cannot escape your culture. No, nobody can, including us moderns. And so there are certain passages in Epictetus or in Seneca or in Marcus Aurelius that are clearly reflective, not necessarily of the precepts uh, of, of Stoic philosophy as much as of their time. For instance, they take their attitude towards sex. Right? For the Roman Stoics, sex is acceptable. They are explicit about this. Both Epictetus, Musonius Rufus, and Seneca, all three of them, are explicit about this. Uh, sex is acceptable only within marriage and only for procreation. That sounds like a pretty Christ, strict Christian view of things, mm -hmm. right? Um, but now compare that to what Zeno was saying, uh, the, the founder of Stoicism. Zeno, of course, was in Athens, lived in Athens, and lived in Athens like three or, uh, 300 years before, right? Three or 400 years before. Well, for Zeno, you can have sex with anybody at any time. He, he says in the in the Republic that we should have a community of of, of people. Uh, you can you can have sex whatever whenever you want with anybody. It's like okay, so how do I square those two things? What does Stoicism tell me then about sex? Right? It turns out it doesn't tell me anything in that sense. What the only thing that that I can derive in terms of modern attitude is that, for instance, I make a, uh, I argue in the book in the, in the field guide that. We should have, we should try to have sex with uh, people that we love, with people that we have a relationship with. That doesn't mean only for re for procreation, uh, because there is nothing intrinsically in incorrect, even from a Stoic perspective, about having pleasure. Pleasure is a preferred indifferent for the Stoics, so no, no Stoic says that we shouldn't have pleasure, and it doesn't have to be marriage, so long as as somebody you actually care about. What I think, from a Stoic perspective, I might object to is casual sex. Uh, because in the case of casual sex, you're actually using another person for your own, your own uh, pleasure. Right? You, don't, you don't care about them. You're just, it, they're just a means to an end. And that one, I think it's debatable. I think it's, the Stoics might have a tr trouble with that. One thing they certainly would object to is things like uh, relationships outside of your, of your own relationship when they are not open, when they're not agreed upon. Let's, mm -hmm. So in other words, cheating, right? Why not? Well, because if you're cheating, you're betraying somebody else's trust. And trust is a virtue. Being trustworthy is a virtue. So you're being non-virtuous in that point, right? And so I think that I'm pretty convinced that the Stoic philosophy uh, pretty much says that you should never cheat on somebody else. Now, if you want to have an open relationship, that's a different issue. If you want to have a polyamorous relationship, that's a different issue because that's by agreement, by mutual agreement, right? You're not cheating on anybody. You're not betraying anybody's, anybody's trust. So what I conclude, therefore, is that Stoicism does have something to say about important aspects of our life, such as, you know, sex and relationships. But what it says, it's not necessarily what Epictetus says, um, because Epictetus was a, a, a product of his own time, and so he had his own blind, you know, blinders there uh, in place that even he, no matter how smart he was and no matter how wise he was, even he couldn't get out of it. And of course, the same is true for us. I'm pretty sure that we rationalize certain things today that you know, a few centuries down the road, people would say, really, these people thought that? What the hell was wrong with them, right? Right. Even talk um, of slavery in Stoic texts, although there are a lot yeah. of passages that recognize like, hey, well, uh, a slave is a human too, and you should share dinner with them and treat them just like everyone else and not be violent, not be abusive. And it, it wasn't even necessarily condoning slavery, but rather it was just recognized as a part of that time. Exactly. And we don't anymore, frank frankly, right? And uh, in fact, I, I might go as far as making a bet toward the future, I might say, I, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, in the future, people will look at non-vegetarian diets as uh, morally uh, reprehensible. Mm -hmm. We don't today. We, we, no, most of us don't. I mean, some of us do, obviously. Vegetarians certainly do, and vegans certainly do. But by and large, society is not at that point yet, right? But I'm convinced that, uh, you know, because I've, and, and I say this, by the way, as a non-vegetarian. I'm not a vegetarian. Uh, I 
my diet tends to lean in that direction. So I, like the writer Michael Pollan, I actually, my diet is mostly plants, right? Uh, not too much and mostly plants. That's what he says to, to, to he advises to eat. Don't eat too much and eat mostly plants. But I'm not strictly a vegetarian. Uh, nevertheless, I spent a lot of time thinking about the arguments that vegetarians put forth. And, you know, I'm sorry, but they, they have the higher moral ground. There's no question about it. In terms of uh, animal suffering, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, labor treatment of other human beings in the, in the meat industry, uh, in terms of environmental impact, there's just no, no, no competition. There's no context. Uh, I think they're right. And so I think that eventually uh, we will get to that point if, uh, if human morality keeps making progress. Now, you mentioned slavery, right? So at, in the ancient times, slavery was unquestioned. It, that was liter it was literally the economic engine of uh, ancient society, not just Roman, but also Greek society. Uh, at some point, we started questioning this thing, but we did go through a transition phase, right? Where people like, just as recently as a couple of hundred years ago, you had people like Thomas Jefferson, who on the one hand was, you know, agreed that slavery was not the moral thing to do, and yet he had slaves. He, re he realized that there was a problem there, and yet he had slaves. That's like just like me realizing that, you know, not being a vegetarian is problematic, and yet I can't quite make myself into a vegetarian, right? Uh, but then you wait only 50 years after Jefferson, and that was a, a no-brainer. Of course you shouldn't own slaves. And so I think that, you know, if I had to make a bet, I would say that that's going to be one of the next frontiers in, uh, in moral progress in, in, in terms of humanity. Good. And finally, it's a question from a listener here relating to the current pandemic. It's 2020, so it's inevitable to <laughs> discuss <laughs> and mention it. She writes here, unless it's been done to death, do you have any particular useful approaches to dealing with this unique situation of life being so restrictive for maybe a year or more, especially less time spent in person with others? Yes. In fact, I actually written a couple of essays about uh, how to think like an act like a stoic in the middle of, of a pandemic. And of course, the obvious thing that comes to mind, but that one has been done to death, I'm afraid, uh, is the dichotomy of control. Right. So like in every in every situation in life, according to the stoic, but particularly in the middle of a pandemic, you should always ask yourself what is up to me and what is not up to me? What is under my control? and What is not under my control? And then you should focus on what is on, under your control, what you can actually do. And uh, take the rest as it, as it comes, right? As develop an attitude of equanimity. Like, for instance, let me give you a specific example. But then I want to talk about a different aspect, which I think is a little bit more novel about a stoic response to a pandemic. But let me give you an example, a very you know, simple example, day-to-day uh, -day example of the economy of control applying to a pandemic. I used to, with my wife, we used to have constantly friends over for dinner. That, that was an important part of our life, right? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we like to cook. We like to have, you know, nice conversations. We usually invite a small num number of friends. We're not like big parties kind of people because in a big party, you can't really have a conversation. <laughs> a <meaningful laughs> conversation. So we, we invite like, you know, four or five people and we have dinner around the table. And so that is clearly something that is, the pandemic has affected. You know, we can't do that right now. We haven't been able to do that since March. And now we're, we are in November. We probably won't be able to do it until at least next summer. So that means more than a year in total. So what do we do? Well, on a regular basis, we've started having what we call virtual aperitivos. An aperitivo is uh, the Italian fancy word for happy hour, basically. <laughs> uh, right? So and Italians, are, it's very much, in Italy, this is very much part of the culture. You go out for an aperitivo with friends. You go before dinner, uh, you go and have a drink with food. Uh, it's not just drinking. Uh, that's a one of the major differences with the happy hour notion. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a communal thing. You're, you're with a small number of friends. Again, it's not a party. Uh, you do it with your intimate friends. So you have a nice conversation for an hour or two and then move on and do something else. So we do virtual aperitivo. We host virtual aperitivo with my wife. I, we turn on our Zoom and uh, we invite a small number of people every time. We do it usually on, you know, like Friday, Saturday and Sunday night, something like that. And for an hour, an hour and a half, we have a conversation, we raise a toast, uh, you know, we, we share, you know, uh, what, what kind of food we're, we're uh, eating. We, sometimes we even try to coordinate things, you know, so we eat pretty much the same things as if we were, in fact, physically together. Now, is it the same thing as a real in-person experience? Of course not. But given the circumstances, 
there's no point in me, you know, focusing on regretting the fact that I cannot have a physical meeting with my friends. I can't. So regretting it just makes me feel worse and it's not going to help the situation at all. It's much better to focus on alternatives. Even though the alternatives might be suboptimal, they still are better than nothing. And so I think that's, that's really a useful way to, use the, to, to apply the dichotomy of control. But what I was going in response to your, your listener's uh, question was that it, an interesting way, I think, of considering on, you know, treating the, the pandemic is um, as if you were into a, in exile. The Stoics were big about exile because at the time this was a big deal, right? Seneca writes about his exile because he was in exile in Corsica uh, for several years. Um, and he writes a whole letter uh, of consolation to his, to his mother, Elvia, from exile. And he tells, he tells her why it is that he's actually okay, that he's actually fine. He's having a, a good life, a meaningful life, even though he's in exile. Musonius Rufus was sent into exile twice. In one case, was in the island of Giara, in uh, uh, off the coast of uh, in the Aegean Sea, off the coast of Greece, and that was a pretty barren island. There was really nothing there, and yet he was able to establish a school of philosophy there, with other exiles. Epictetus was sent into exile in Nicopolis, on north in northwestern Greece, and he was able to establish, re-establish his school, which became one of the most flourishing schools in the ancient world. So. Uh, so exile was a big deal for the ancients, and so the Stoics write a lot about exile. And we can think of a pandemic, the situation under a pandemic, as if we were sent into exile. All of a sudden, our movements are restricted, our social interactions are restricted, the number of things that we can do is much more limited, right? And just like the Stoics said, well, don't focus on what you lost, because you lost it. And, you know, either temporarily or permanently. Some of those people were sent into exile permanently for the rest of their lives, right? Uh, most of them were not. Often exile was kind of reversed. People were recalled, right? Uh, Seneca actually was called back to Rome. Musonius Rufus was called, called back to Rome. Epictetus wasn't, inter interestingly. He, he, you know, he, he stayed in exile for the rest of his life. But in our case, we're probably going to be recalled from the exile. At some point, you know, vaccines, treatments, stuff like that, it's going to happen. And uh, we, we will, the exile will, will, will end. But in the meantime, I would say, go there and read what Musonius Rufus, Epictetus, and Seneca write about exile. Because it's really very much the same situation. And what they suggest to do is not to focus on what you're missing out on, not to, you know, because regret is not helpful. It just makes you more miserable. Focus instead on new ways of doing things that are meaningful to you and to your friends and to your family. And then there are still plenty of those things that we can do. And so uh, we need to focus on the stuff that we have agency on, that we can actually affect, that we can actually control. And then the rest is like, you know, we, we, we have to accept that it comes uh, as, it, as it comes. All right, very good. We're coming on the end of our conversation here. One hour, uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty fast here. And yeah, I know, right? Once again, here with Massimo Piliucci, author of A Field Guide to a Happy Life, 53 Brief Lessons for Living, and many, many other books. How can people find you online and, of course, your books? Uh, online uh, can be found at massimopiliucci.com. That's kind of the, the place to go if you are interested in my essays, my books, my podcasts, my anything. Or you can follow me on Twitter at M Pilucci, M P I G L I U C C I. And in terms of books, yeah, I mean, I, I hope people will check out the field guide to a good life. Uh, if you're already uh, interested in stoicism, however, and you want to practice uh, stoicism seriously, then I, I suggest a book that I co authored with my friend. Uh, Greg Lopez and the book title the book's title is a handbook for new stoics and it's it's a series of exercises It's a hand you know, it's a how-to book basically uh, that you can go through um, And uh, learn how to practice stoicism day to day and Kindle an audio book as well I'm yes. seeing on that and many other titles that you have certainly during this pandemic It's not a time for excuses all those things you've said. Hey, I don't have enough time for this or that well, exactly. <laughs> what we better do. time is there than today, right? Uh, yeah. Say, uh, what was that about the Olympic Games that the the Olympics are today, right? Don't don't be procrastinating forever. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> the Olympic Games, in fact, if it is, says the Olympics have already started. So you're already <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. Thanks for your time today.
It was great. Thank, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more content. Visit my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com for past episodes and social media links. Support my efforts through Patreon or Subscribestar, linked on my website, to receive special perks, including having upcoming podcast guests answer your questions, custom-made podcast episodes, and private one-on-one calls to discuss whatever you'd like. Visit my other podcast at hurdygurdytravel.com, that's H-U-R-D-Y-G-U-R-D-Y travel.com, to learn how to make money, save money, and travel the world at next to no cost with credit card rewards, deals, and loyalty programs. Thanks to generous patrons and fans of this podcast who help support my work. Have a great day.